Hola, queridos agentes. Bienvenidos al episodio 61. Welcome to episode 61 of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. If you've been struggling to become fluent in Spanish, you may be wondering, do you have to drop everything and move to a Spanish-speaking country to finally achieve fluency? Well, in this episode, I sit down with Jessica Taylor, widely known as DJ Tay, who shares how immersion helped her improve her conversational Spanish fluency beyond formal education. Jessica is the founder of the wildly popular For the Love of Bachata event. She shares her story of how she went from a reluctant Spanish student to a Spanish teacher and a sought after Latin music DJ. At the end of the episode, stick around because we'll also give you some information about some events that you can attend if you're interested in a true immersion experience with not only Spanish, but also with Latino culture. I also have a few discounts for you, so make sure you stick around to the end of the episode so that you can hear more information. So with that, let's get started. Vamos a empezar. Bienvenidos. Welcome to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast, the show for Spanish learners that love music, travel, and culture. Close your grammar textbooks, shut down the language apps, and open your ears to how Spanish is spoken in the real world. Let us show you how to go from beginner to bilingual. Here is your host, certified language coach, Tamara Marie. Hola, Jessica. Bienvenida a Learn Spanish con Salsa. Hola. Gracias por tenerme aquí. If you could share with the audience, uh, for people who may not know you, um, just kind of tell them a little bit about you and how you got into uh, this thing called bachata. Sure. I run For the Love Bachata here in Pittsburgh. I've been doing that for the last seven years, and I was inspired um, to dance bachata and salsa actually back in college with some Latino friends I had. And I don't know, everything just kind of led me to where I am now, you know, hosting events and DJing as well. English is my first language and Spanish is my second language. So what made you want to learn Spanish when what got you into Latino culture? You know, I feel like everything in my life has been accidental. It's been unplanned, you know, both with what dance has become to me, but also with Spanish. You know, I'm currently a Spanish teacher. I teach kindergarten, first and second grade currently, but I have taught um, K to five in the last 10 years. And my students always assume that I was just like always passionate and always like the best student. And that's just not my story. So um, I started learning Spanish in middle school. I think like a lot of people here in the United States, I almost didn't even take Spanish. I almost signed up for German because I thought it was easier, you know, like typical 11 year old mindset. But thank goodness my mom intervened and guided me towards a language that would be more relevant to my interests. And then I kind of took it through middle school and high school, not really always liking it that much, but you know, always doing my best because I valued doing good work. And it wasn't really until my last year of high school when I was in like level five Spanish that I felt like, oh, I'm starting to be able like to use it. And that was all thanks to the teacher I had that year. She was really exceptional. And then even when I went to college, I went originally to be a computer and business teacher, not a Spanish teacher. But I tested well on the entrance exam when I got to college and they let me skip out of a couple of the bottom level of classes so I kind of thought like oh maybe I will double major and then at the end you know I'll, I'll be fluent in Spanish at very least and it turned out to be the thing that I love the most you know it majoring in Spanish in college brought me into studying abroad in Costa Rica first and then in Spain it brought new people into my life and I've always loved and appreciated diversity so that has been really great and I also just learned how much more fun it can be to, to teach a language because language encompasses all aspects of, you know, being a human on this earth. You could teach anything while teaching the language as well. So yeah, it was, it was never really planned. It just kind of unfolded with the years of my life. 
Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because I, I think a lot of us, like you mentioned, um, being from the U.S., we all have a similar experience. They tell you pick a foreign language, right, in uh, middle school, which in my opinion is way too late. So I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that you're actually teaching at a K through five level. Um, but, you know, we, we pick a language and then we may or may not really be into it. And I love how you were saying how things just unfolded for you and that as you realized you were good at it and then you started to have these experiences that that's when you really developed uh, more of a passion for it. Because I think like a lot of us, anything that's academic or learning, especially if we weren't good students in school, that we can have these misperceptions about our ability to learn a language, especially as adults. You know, so we have this feeling like, oh, I'm just bad at languages because I didn't do well in school. And also how long it took for things to click for you. So you said you went to Spanish level five in high school and I had a similar experience. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think I had a teacher as good as a teacher, it sounds like you had, <laughs> that made it relevant. <laughs> I, when I first left the country, I realized I couldn't understand or speak any Spanish at all for, with my like public school education. So um, I'm curious to hear when you actually felt like, you know, I'm actually fluent in Spanish or that I've mastered the language. Like you mentioned traveling abroad and going to Costa Rica. So was there a specific moment you remember where you were like, oh, I finally have this down and I finally feel like I speak Spanish. I'm not just learning Spanish. You know, I don't feel like I had that aha moment. I know a lot of people get it and it might be because I was spending those years of my life becoming a Spanish teacher and worrying about was I going to pass the proficiency exam and, you know, just always having that laser sharp focus on the accuracy of my language. I don't know if I ever stopped to appreciate the point that I was conversing fluidly, you know, and effortlessly. But looking back, I would say it probably happened the semester I spent in Spain, thanks to the immersion and, and the length of time I was there. Um, because when I had been to Costa Rica before, that was just four weeks long. So it was a great experience. But looking back, I can remember like times I had no idea what people were saying to me. But in Spain, I was living with family. So I was having conversations all day long. So do you think that immersion and actually being in the country was sort of the key to get you from uh, sort of just where you felt like you were proficient, focused on passing exams to where you, you really started to feel like you were fluent? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the best way that you can learn. If that's something that you can afford time-wise and financially, I think that's the best. So you mentioned travel, and we do talk a lot about travel on the podcast. And I do want to segue to talking a little bit about um, different places that you visited and specifically um, an event coming up in the Dominican Republic in a few minutes. Uh, but first, I want to just kind of get at this idea of immersion. So I know a lot of people say that, you know, in order to learn a language of fluency, that you have to sort of pack your bags and go to a different country. But for those of us who can't afford to do that or, or to uh, stay for a, a long term basis, what kind of advice would you give to them? And what do you do sort of with your students as well to sort of help create an immersion environment, even if you're not traveling? So with my students, they're so little. In kindergarten and first grade, they're not even very literate yet. So it's really hard to recommend, you know, a lot of like the digital experiences that are out there that can be more accessible to people. So in my classes, I try to create lessons where I can use, you know, like moments of kind of like simulated immersion with them. And certain lessons lend themselves to that better than others. But I try to give them that experience where they have to figure out what we're doing in this lesson by using not just the words that they know, but by also learning to use their other senses to figure out what we're doing. You know, so I did like a lesson on sink and float with the students and I had the big, you know, smart board lesson with the objects and I had the physical objects. I had a big container of water, you know, and I wasn't using any English, but because they were learning to look for other clues, they were able to follow along and participate and you know make predictions record their answers decide if the prediction had been correct or not you know so that's what i try to do for the little ones um if you're older finding lessons like that is a challenge right because like like you said you know our public school education didn't always have the best teaching methods and you also find that in community education as well 
but I would totally recommend for adults to find conversation clubs where you get together and everyone kind of agrees to speak the language together um, because that's a place where you can really grow when you're experiencing that that struggle to communicate, you know, but that's where you grow is when you push through. So that's what I would recommend. Yeah. And I found a great resource for that is meetup.com. Usually no matter where you are, um, definitely in the U S but even in some other places that if you just kind of search for Spanish meetups, you can find that. Um, what I find, like you mentioned, just sort of that struggle of being able to communicate Uh, what happens with like a lot of lessons that you take or if you take a class is that you always kind of have that crutch where you can switch back to English right mm -hmm. if you get stuck <laughs> so if you you have to find a good group and you're right it is hard I think to find a group where everyone agrees not to revert to English and they actually don't do it <laughs> right because yeah. it's so easy and I've also found in social situations I don't know if you found this as well is when you're in a Um, I call it like sort of a mixed group, uh, at least uh, linguistically. So if you have some people that speak Spanish, some people that speak Spanish and English, some people that only speak English, especially here in the U.S., like you'll usually end up in a social situation speaking English just because you don't want to leave people out mm -hmm. that don't speak Spanish. So it can be kind of awkward, right, to try to get that conversation practice in, in a true social setting, like with friends. So I always recommend, like you said, too, like find people who are intentional about we're going to speak Spanish because in, in mixed companies, sometimes you don't always get that full immersion. Yeah, I totally agree. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about how, um, one, I want to, I'm curious to know how you became a DJ and specifically uh, for Bachata because Bachata is from Dominican Republic. You're there in Pittsburgh. So I'm really curious about the connection between you and I know you travel, you mentioned going to Costa Rica and then to Spain. But, but sort of how did you then get into bachata and then Dominican culture? <laughs> It's kind of like the story of me becoming a Spanish teacher. So way back in high school, I know that I always loved when I would see like salsa dancing in movies and I wanted to do it, but it wasn't something that was available to me at that time. And then um, in college, I started hanging out with more students in like the Latin student organization as a way to kind of connect with others um, in a way that was relevant to my major. And they kind of started teaching me to dance. So that was um, my first entrance into dancing. I loved it. You know, I loved that every time you would hang out with people, like dancing would break out, you know. And then when I graduated, so I didn't start dancing right away. I right away went into like a, a, a graduate program and teaching ESL for 10 months. So. But that landed me in Ecuador for a month one summer and I was so, I, I thought I was going to have like the best dancing experience ever because obviously like I don't necessarily know the roots of all these dances yet. You know, I, I know salsa, I know merengue, I know bachata, but I don't realize that they're not necessarily native to Ecuador. So I, <laughs> needless to say, I was super disappointed that I already knew a lot more than the locals there because in Otavalo, in, in Ecuador where I was, at least in that one place you know they knew like the basic step and a basic turn and that was it it was super chill and you know I was just like so like deprived of what I had known in college so when I came home that's when I started taking salsa lessons in Pittsburgh and instantly like fell in love soon after like I realized my community didn't really like bachata that much And I had an instructor that he liked bachata and he got me starting to go to like DC for bachata events like, um, you know, DC Bachata Congress and other ones. So I was coming home like, you know, like, look everybody, there's like all this great music and there's like all these things you can do and it's better than like what you know. And people were like, nah, 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 nah. You know, and I was, I was also trying to get the DJs to play this other, you know, all these other songs that I had found and they're telling me no. And so eventually, I'm told that this is called situational leadership, right? So I felt the need and I decided to start for La Bachata, right? At first it was supposed to just be sharing music with people, which got me doing more and more research. Along the way, I accidentally started doing events, uh, an outdoor social I had done with just a few friends before, just like exploded. There were like a hundred people the one time So that kind of propelled me into hosting events 
and I did that for a couple of years and I was obviously playing my own music because the other DJs weren't playing what I asked of them in the first place and um, I was just making playlists in iTunes but other people were like you think like a DJ you think like a DJ you need to start DJing so um, I told them after I finished with my master's degree because obviously I never stopped taking classes for some reason um, I told them I would begin so in 2015 I got my first controller and I started DJing well I love that I love the idea of like the DJs not playing the music you like so you become a DJ <laughs> yourself <laughs> like, I, there's so many times I wish I could do that I can't tell you but anyway <laughs> <laughs> this episode of learn Spanish con salsa is brought to you by the Spanish conversation mastery course start speaking Spanish with confidence in just eight weeks the Spanish Conversation Mastery Course will give you the essential phrases, vocabulary, and practice you need to build your confidence speaking Spanish. Learn Spanish through dialogues with real Spanish speakers and over 17 audio lessons covering a diverse range of conversation topics so you'll be ready for almost any situation. Easy, fill-in-the-blank scripts are provided to help you develop your conversation talking points in minutes. Use the code SpanishConSalsa to get 15% off lifetime access to the course. Go to SpanishConversationMastery.com and start speaking Spanish today. That's SpanishConversationMastery.com. I know we talked about sort of your travels and learning Spanish, but now I want to talk about like your travels as a DJ, because I know you've been all over the place and I'm always seeing uh, the For the Love of Bachata. I've heard great things about the events there that you have in Pittsburgh. Uh, and even though I'm from Baltimore, so I'm a Ravens fan through and through. So, I, you know, for me, it's enemy <laughs> territory. <laughs> going to Steelers town, but I might be able to get over that for the love of bachata. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, one event I want to talk to you about in particular, because I know it's coming up, and I had uh, Carlos Cinta on the show last year. We talked a little bit about uh, bachata paradise. And just for those of uh, those folks who may be familiar with going to like a salsa congress or like you mentioned the DC Bachata Congress that's like in a big hotel and sort of you have workshops and you have performances and dancing. Uh, could you explain a little bit about the events Bachata Paradise and how that's different from a traditional sort of dance salsa or bachata congress? It really is um, a cultural experience, you know, like you and everyone else are staying in one of several resorts in the town. They're all walking distance from each other. And the workshops are spread out at different venues. Like one is a dance school, one is a bar and restaurant, you know, and there, there's a couple others and everything's just walking distance from itself. So you're getting to know the town, you're getting to know the people, you're getting to know the sites. And then he's also built in these excursions so every day you kind of get in a flow like you get up you have your breakfast you take your workshops you get back you get ready and then one day it's the beach party they take you to the beach and there's music and everybody's dancing and it's amazing you know another day it's a pool party and another day it's a trip to a natural pool it's just really incredible and then when you come back from that you have dinner you get ready you go out dancing in town again. Like, it's just so cool. It is such a cool experience. Can you talk a little bit about the town? Because I know you mentioned, like, it's sort of like you're in this particular town. And a lot of people, when they think of DR, they think of Punta Cana, right? And they think of, like, staying at an all-inclusive resort and kind of just kind of being there and being on the beach. Uh, but tell us a little bit about the town and sort of, like, what kind of interaction you're able to have since you mentioned it was such, like, an immersive experience being there. Sure. It is not like your big, fancy, Americanized resort feel. Even like the resorts, you know, they have that Dominican vibe. Overall, it's like a, it's a smaller town. Like I said, everything you can walk to, everything's really chill. You know, it's not super Americanized, which is refreshing for those who want to travel to see the culture, you know, to experience the dance in its authentic form or to practice the language. Uh, so the area Las Terrenas, is that uh, sort of like a safe area of the country or is it an urban area? Oh, it's very safe. I mean, I wouldn't, I would never tell someone like just go 
out by yourself at night. Like you always want to be aware of yourself, but um, it felt very comfortable. Like me and one or two friends would walk everywhere together at night and we never had an issue. Um, there's always people out, so that is another thing that helps you feel pretty safe. But yeah, that the town just has kind of that chill vibe. So it's more like, like a small beach town versus like a big resort or like a big urban area. Yeah, for sure. And so you mentioned uh, also like being able to talk to people and getting immersed in the language. So I'm curious because you said that you spent some time in Spain and in Costa Rica. And I know that Spanish spoken in Dominican Republic is very different than both of those places. <laughs> so could you talk a little bit about, did you have any culture shock when it, when you were, uh, you know, got there and you were talking to uh, the Dominicans there or were you just kind of used to it because you've already been listening to a lot of bachata? So was it like a shock for you or were you able to like pick it up pretty quick? You know, so I didn't mention earlier when I was talking about dance, but I had been to the Dominican Republic some years ago. It was in 2011. Um, it was between studying programs and I wanted to work on my Spanish. So I went to, first it was Santo Domingo and I was staying in a Spanish school, but um, I actually got really bored in Santo Domingo because it rained all the time in the summer and the beach was so far. So we transferred north to Sosua and um, we spent a weekend in Samana before we did that, which La Serrenas is in Samana, so I was already familiar with the area. Um, and so I spent about three weeks total in the country. So I was already somewhat acclimate, acclimated to the sound of the accent. I find that their accent is so like rhythmic and calming for me. But um, <laughs> the, the like slang that they use, you know how they, they, they cut their words in half. Um, they yeah. have their own things like que lo que, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like those are probably the only two like phrases that I know what they mean. Um, Cause I was there <laughs> for like three weeks <laughs> and I came back still like utterly confused sometimes. So <laughs> there is that, <laughs> but you also get that when you travel, you know, cause there's like 21 countries in the world that speak Spanish. So it's, you know, you just roll with the flow but I did have that experience too the first time I went to DR. As soon as I got off the plane, someone says, ay, Tamara, que lo que? And I was like, huh? I was like, what's a que? <laughs> you know what? I'm literally like trying to translate in my head like the what, that which, what, huh? I was like, I don't know what's going on right now. Uh -huh. So yeah, it can, it can be something to get used to, but it's interesting because like when I first started as well, um, I realized that every time I would travel to a different place that the dialects were very different. And in school, they tell you, oh, Spanish is just Spanish, right? Like, oh, it's like this one language. It's like, you know, super generic. And then in traveling and talking to people, you find out that's not true. So that actually is what led me to sort of come up with my own guide to like Dominican Spanish. Like I compiled a, a phrase book of like, I think I have over like 200 something different words and phrases that are just used in DR. Um, oh, wow. And then works with some of the teachers on the island to develop a course, right? Like with dialogues, because uh, if you're not used to the accent, you really, it's going to be hard, right? Uh, to kind of get up to speed, like especially if we're just there for like a week for mm -hmm. an event. So, um, so I had developed that because there just literally was nothing out there. And it's even different, like even if you have friends that live in the U.S. that are from the Dominican Republic or have families from there, like I find that even they speak differently. So like when they go back to the island, people go, oh, you talk like an American, right? Yeah. So they don't, it's it's really interesting. And like if you're, especially if you're just starting out in Spanish or if you're, you can't really hear the differences in the accents yet, um, it can be tough to sort of sort all that out on your own. So I do think that um, just being aware of it and being prepared to know that, you know, maybe it's not that your Spanish proficiency isn't up to par, but maybe it's just like a phrase that you haven't heard before because of where you are. I think that always kind of right. helps just to have that cultural awareness. Yeah. And I, I think Dominicans are fairly aware that they have, you know, kind of, this unique pocket of Spanish. So when you express your confusion, I think they're pretty good at adapting for you. Yeah, I think there's this like, uh, I, I actually don't believe in neutral Spanish, but I do think that there is this thing that happens even amongst native speakers when they know that they're from different countries that they sort of 
have to adjust and adapt like okay you're not from where I'm from just like I would call it the same as like if you are talking to someone in your family versus like someone at work that you just met like you're not going to go into like all of your you know insider phrases and like stuff that only you talk about your family with so it's kind of like that right like you you're aware of like who you're talking to and you sort of adjust so that they are more comfortable but yeah. it is cool to kind of know ahead of time some of the phrases like que lo que, right so- <laughs> yeah that one you're gonna hear all the time <laughs> yeah just don't walk into a business meeting saying that but yeah nope. definitely if you right. read uh, informally yeah you can say that okay well jessica i want to thank you so much for your time um and sharing a little bit about your experience with bachata paradise um really glad i got a chance to talk to you about the event and also just hearing about your experience and i hope that really inspires anyone that's listening who may really be into latin dance to latin music but you don't speak the language um that you don't have to start out having been a genius at languages from birth that you can you know it's it is something that you can pick up um even as an adult and it's something that you mm-hmm. that you can learn so jessica for those out there who are not familiar with for love of bachata how can they find you on social media and get in touch with you you can follow on instagram at for love bachata on facebook just search for love bachata you could like the page and on on those two social media platforms i post you know, all of our events. I will post on on the Facebook page. I'll also post about other events and dancers and stuff that could inspire you. Um, And if you want just a lot of information concentrated about For Love Bachata events, I would go to the website, which is forlovebachata.com. Great. Thank you so much for your time. And thanks for being on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jessica. Now, if you're interested in your own Spanish immersion experience, I definitely would suggest that you check out the event Bachata Paradise. If you're interested in more information, you can go to bachataparadise.com, which is B-A-C-H-A-T-A paradise.com. I'm also going to include a link in the show notes with all the information about Bachata Paradise and also Jessica's event for the love of Bachata. So you can check out ForTheLoveOfBachata.com as well if you're interested in attending an event in the U.S. But if you're ready for a full immersion experience and you want to go to the Dominican Republic this May, join us at Bachata Paradise. Yes, I said join us because we will be having a meetup for any podcast listeners that attend the event. I will be there this year in 2020. Uh, It will be from May 21st to the 31st. So it is a full 10-day event. There are four-day, seven-day, and 10-day packages available. So you, if you can't stay for the full 10 days, uh, you can definitely check out one of the shorter options. Now, this is an all-inclusive event. So your pass includes your lodging, your um, transportation. So you get your transfer from the airport uh, to the resort where you're staying. Uh, it includes meals. It includes all the parties, workshops, performances, Uh, everything that's going on at the event and in the town of Las Terrenas, you'll be able to attend with your pass to Bachata Paradise. Now, I will warn you if you're listening to this in 2020 and it is before May 21st and you're thinking about going, I would definitely get on it right now, at least to secure your deposit because spaces are going quickly. If you're listening to this after 2020, this event does happen every year. So still check out bachattheparadise.com and I will make sure that the show notes page is updated with the information for this year's event if it is after May 2020 when you're hearing this, okay? So go to learnspanishconsalsa.com forward slash 61. That's learnspanishconsalsa.com forward slash 61. And there you'll be able to access the show notes page with all the information about the event. Now, if you're sure that you're ready to check it out, um, you can go right to bachataparadise.com. And if you want a discount, and of course, you know, I'm always looking out for you guys. I always want to make sure that you can enjoy things uh, with a little bit of a reduced rate if I can get that for you. So if you're interested in attending Bachata Paradise, you can enter the code SCS for Spanish con salsa. That's SCS4 for the four day package. SCS7 for the seven day package or SCS10 for the 10 day package. So, again, if you're interested, I'm also going to include those codes in the show notes page so that you don't have to remember them right now. But make sure, again, if you're interested in attending in 2020, get on it right now. See what spaces are left and at least get in your deposit so that you can secure your spot for the event. 
So I hope to see you in the Dominican Republic this May, if not, hopefully on a future trip. And whatever you do, make sure that you find an opportunity to immerse yourself, not only in the Spanish language, but it also an aspect of Latino culture that you love, whether it be literature or music or dance, whatever it is, make sure that you have a full immersion experience because that will definitely help you achieve fluency faster. So that is it for this episode of the podcast. I hope that something you have heard today has helped you go one step closer from Spanish beginner to bilingual. Hasta la próxima. Thank you for listening to the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast at LearnSpanishConSalsa.com.